Welcome to the VMark Designer tutorial. In this video, I'm going to discuss the design elements of a VMark and give you an overview of how VMarks are created in Adobe Illustrator using the VMark Designer tool. We'll use VMark Designer to set up a VMark project and validate the design workflow. This video complements the VMark Design Guide, which can be found in the Vuforia Developer Library. Be sure to review the design guide for more detailed instructions and best practices for designing VMARCs. The installation and use of Vuforia Designer Scripts is documented in the article, Designing a VMARC in Adobe Illustrator, which is in the library as well. Before we get into the Illustrator workflow, I want to review the design elements of a VMARC. It's critical to understand what these are and what they do. In order to design a ViewMark that both meets your design goals and is recognizable by the Vuforia SDK, there are five key elements to every ViewMark design the contour, border, clear space, code elements, and the background or design area. The foundation of a ViewMark design is its contour. This identifies the ViewMark and all of its instances. The contour is the outline formed by the intersection of the border and clear space areas. A ViewMark contour must be made up of straight lines with no less than four and no more than 20 segments. There should be a high contrast between the border and clear space areas. This is what distinguishes the contour and makes the ViewMark detectable. The ViewMark's design elements are used to encode data within the ViewMark design. Each element has dark and bright states which are alternated in combination with other elements to code data in the format you've selected. Lastly, there is the design area. You are free to apply whatever designs you like in this region of the ViewMark. It's a good place for brand logos or icons. Now let's see how these elements are applied and validated in Illustrator using the Vuforia Designer scripts. The workflow steps for creating a ViewMark are as follows. You'll install Vuforia Designer and then use Designer to set up an artboard in Adobe Illustrator. You'll then design the layers of your ViewMark iteratively, validating each step using the Designer verification script. Once you have a complete and validated ViewMark, you'll export it as a scalable vector graphics file. You'll then upload that file to the Vuforia Target Manager and add it to a ViewMark database. That database can then be added to your Vuforia app. You can obtain Vuforia Designer from the Tools section under Downloads at developer.vuforia.com. Download the Designer Archive to your file system and unpack the archive. This will create a new folder with the ViewMark Export, Setup, and Verify scripts. Copy these scripts into the script folder in the path of your Adobe Illustrator installation. The location of this folder will differ based on your operating system. See the ViewMark Design Guide for the path to use. Now launch Illustrator, you'll find them in the Illustrator menus under File, Scripts. You'll need to relaunch Illustrator if it was open when you installed these scripts. Now let's get started designing a ViewMark. The first step is to execute the ViewMark setup script. This will launch the ViewMark template setup dialog, which enables you to define the name, data type, and data length or range your ViewMark can encode. It will also tell you how many data elements you'll need in the ViewMark design to encode your data. So I'm going to name this ViewMark for the ViewMark tutorial that I'm presenting to you. You can see that there are three data formats available for encoding information, strings, numbers, and bytes. These can be used to encode different types of data. Each data type has a corresponding length or range value that defines how much data of that type can be encoded in the ViewMark. This value corresponds to the numbers of characters a string can hold, the range of values that a numeric ViewMark can encode, or how many bytes of data can be encoded in a byte-based ViewMark. The length and range property values also determine how many data elements you'll need to include in your ViewMark design. The greater the size, the more elements you'll need. I'm going to use a string data type that uses four characters, and I'm shown that this will require 56 data elements to encode in my ViewMark. Now when I press continue, an artboard will be generated for my project with the necessary layers predefined. On the left is a report detailing the properties of my ViewMark, along with its verification status. There are six tests that your ViewMark will need to pass in order to be a valid ViewMark design. They are described in the Design Guidelines Verification Panel, and also the ViewMark Design Guide. 
On the right, in the Layers panel, are 11 predefined artboard layers. Each of these layers has a different role in identifying the elements of your viewmark design. You'll assign your design elements to these layers according to their purpose and significance within the viewmark design. We're going to be creating the Morton Tuxedo's viewmark template that's included with Before You Designer. Here's what the finished design will look like. On the left is the final design in Illustrator. Those magenta highlights are applied by the designer verification script to indicate the layers of the viewmark template. On the right is an example of what this viewmark looks like after it has been processed by the target manager. This is the version that you will print and apply to objects. I'm going to work from the bottom up when creating my design. And we'll start with the design elements that are significant to the detection and decoding of a viewmark. So the first element to add will be the viewmark clear space layer. This serves as the backdrop for the border of my viewmark design. Here, I'm simply adding a square that will surround the border. I've made it yellow so that you can see it against the white artboard, but I'm going to change this to white once it's in place because I want a white backdrop for my border. The clear space can be on either the interior or exterior of the border. Mine will be on the exterior. I'll add my border design to the viewmark border layer and lay it on top of the clear space layer. Then I'll run the designer verification script to confirm that these elements have sufficient contrast in relation to each other. It's the contrast between a viewmark's border and clear space that enables it to be detected and recognized as a unique viewmark template. There must be at least a 40% difference in contrast between these layers. You can see that this design achieves that because it has passed the border and clear space contrast test. Now I'll mark the contour that is established by the intersection of these layers. This is how I'll identify which edges are significant to defining the shape of my viewmark. A viewmark's contour must be a closed path made up of between 4 and 20 straight edges. To do this, I'll use the pen tool and simply trace the contour edges by connecting the anchor points between the border and clear space. Just click on each anchor point to connect it to the previous one in the contour path. Let's verify that I have a good contour using the designer verification script. Got it. Notice that the script has highlighted my contour with a magenta line. It's a good idea to run the verification script after adding new elements to the viewmark design layers to ensure that they're valid. And we're good to go. I'm going to make this contour layer transparent so that it doesn't occlude the other design elements. The clear space border and contour layers enable this viewmark design to be recognized by the before SDK. Now I'm going to add data elements to capture data that is encoded in my viewmark design. I'll do this using alternating dark and bright versions of the same set of design elements. Before I add these, I'd like to go into a bit more depth on how code elements are designed and organized in a viewmark template. If you remember, when I had selected to use a string data format with four characters for my viewmark, the designer setup dialog told me that I will need to use 56 elements to encode these strings. That's the number of elements needed to capture the full range of character combinations that may be made up of four characters. A code element can be any shape in any arrangement. This one is a diamond. Each code element must have a dark and bright version. You can think of these as the binary states of the element. In this way, code elements are like bits that are used to encode data in the viewmark. I'm going to need 56 of these bits, or elements, to capture any string that can be made up from four characters. The critical requirement for a code element is that its dark and light versions must be in exactly the same position on the viewmark. This is how they are identified with each other. All of the dark elements must be in the dark elements layer, and all of the bright elements must be in the bright elements layer. The code elements also must not fall within the minimum edge areas of the border and clear space. I'll identify these regions for you later in the tutorial. Once you've defined the shapes that you want to use, you can arrange these in relation to the overall design of your remark template. And remember, whatever the arrangement, 
The dark and bright versions of the constituent code elements need to be positioned in exactly the same position on the ViewMark template. Here's an example of how these elements can be designed from the Morton Tuxedo's ViewMark template. This design is made up of 56 individual diamond shapes. They are grouped in two triangular arrangements to resemble the pocket handkerchief and cummerbund worn with a tuxedo. Here you see the bright version. I've added it to the ViewMark Bright Elements layer. Notice how this arrangement falls entirely within the interior area of the magenta band outlining my border design. That band represents the minimum border area that I had alluded to. When placing a collection of code elements, they must not touch either the interior or exterior minimum border areas marked by the magenta highlights that ViewMark Designer will add to your design. Here is the dark version. I'm adding it to the ViewMark Dark Elements layer right on top of its corresponding Bright Elements version. Let's run the verification script again to make sure these elements are valid. Great, we're almost done. I want to add some background elements to complement my design. These won't be significant to the recognition or decoding of this ViewMark, so I'll put them in the ViewMark background layer. The background layer is ignored by the Vuforia SDK. Let's verify one last time to make sure that I haven't broken anything. The finishing touch is to define the origin of my design. This will establish the center point of the ViewMark. Any digital content that augments this ViewMark will be positioned relative to this point in 3D space. You'll notice that I've left two layers empty. These aren't mandatory, but can be helpful to use. The ViewMark asymmetry layer can be used to add an element that indicates the directionality of the ViewMark. This is helpful for rotationally symmetric ViewMarks to indicate the top versus bottom or side facing edges of the ViewMark. The ViewMark user data layer can be used to store metadata about the ViewMark, which you can retrieve using the get user data method. See the ViewMark design guide for more information on the role and use of these layers. Now I'm going to export my ViewMark and upload it to the target manager so that I can use it in my app. I'll select the ViewMark export script and before your designer will process my artboard into an SVG file that I can upload to the target manager. I'll save that file locally and then go to the target manager at developer.vuforia.com. Here, I'm going to create a new database and define it as a ViewMark database. I'll also need to associate this database with a license key. There are already a few in my developer account, but you can create a new one in the license manager. Now I can add my ViewMark. To do that, I'll navigate to the database's name in the database list and click to access its management panel. By selecting Add Target, I'm taken to the Add Target dialog where I can upload my SVG file and define the width of the ViewMark. The width value should correspond to the size that you intend to print the ViewMark using the unit scale of your AR scene. For example, I'm going to print these at three centimeters wide and want to use a millimeter unit scale in my AR scene. So I'll define the ViewMark's width as 30 because 30 millimeters is equivalent to three centimeters. Then I add my ViewMark to the database. You'll see it's updated in the database management panel. Now I can generate a ViewMark instance to print by selecting generate ViewMark. I need to provide an ID value for this instance, and because this ViewMark encodes strings, I'll provide a text value. Remember that the length of the ID value is constrained by the length you defined when originally creating this design. I want to print from an SVG source, so I'll select that option and then download the ViewMark instance. Here it is. The pattern of dark and bright elements that you see is specific to the encoding of the text value that I provided. To use this ViewMark in my app, I'll simply need to download its database and add that to my app's development environment. See the ViewMark developer guide to learn how to do that. You can also generate ViewMark instances programmatically using the ViewMark Generation API, which is a REST API that enables you to retrieve ViewMark instances based on the ID values 